Welcome back to Capital Beat from Orca Media and the Vermont Press Bureau. I'm Neil Goswami, and joining me, as usual, is Josh O'Gorman from the Vermont Press Bureau. Thanks for being here again. Oh, it's always a pleasure, Neil. It is uh, Friday, March 11th. It's mm -hmm. what's known as crossover day in the legislature, where bills that are going to be considered uh, to become law have to clear a committee. Uh, we've had a little bit of action this week. Um, earlier this week, I believe on Wednesday, uh, a DCF protection bill passed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's You've covered that a little bit. I've, mm -hmm. I picked up the ball mm -hmm. on Wednesday, uh, but that's a bill that is uh, focused on enhanced penalties for folks who either assault or uh, threaten DCF mm -hmm. workers. Yeah, absolutely. So this is born out of, well, I mean, there's a number of things was born out of, but probably what brought this issue to the head was the uh, killing of Lara, Lara mm -hmm. Sobel, a DCF worker in uh, August, uh, or pardon me, was in July, in the summer of 2015. Right. Uh, she was shot and killed outside her, her workplace in Barrie by a uh, disgruntled parent of a child who had been removed from yeah. her custody. And so, but you know, there's been an escalation of incidents uh, regarding uh, threats and sometimes assaults right. on DCF workers. And so this this bill has been the product, I guess, of a series of hearings that was held by uh, Dick Sears uh, mm -hmm. Center out of, out of Bennington and others right. just to try to figure out what we're going to do. And so what they ended up doing is uh, they added the classification of DCF worker to the same group of people that includes uh, doctors and emergency responders and police officers right. in terms of if you assault one of these people, it carries a stronger penalty right. than it would if you were to assault, say, you or I. And that's like an, an additional year on the prison in term, yes. another thousand dollars in fines. Mm -hmm. um, and what it also did was criminalize threatening yes. a DCF worker. And, and in many ways, I think that was the more controversial yeah. aspect of it. Uh, there was, there was some, some resistance from the American Civil Liberties Union and, uh, in fact, from the uh, prosecutor in Washington County, who was actually there when L Lara was killed, right. uh, some concern about actually making criminal the act of threatening somebody. Um, yeah. ACLU said, hey, you know, this kind of possibly impedes upon First Amendment free speech issues. And um, the prosecutor said, you know, people just sometimes are just blowing off steam. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't necessarily jail them for it. Right. Um, there are some states that have uh, statutes that have criminalized threatening. Uh, Vermont that never had one before. Right. Uh, before you could be jailed for such things as disorderly conduct or disturbing the peace by telephone. Um, however, uh, this actually makes the act of threatening, as long as it's a very specific threat, right. and as long as the person receiving the threat believes that they are in immediate grave harm, yeah. um, then uh, this is a crime now. Okay. And uh, on, on Wednesday, before passage in the Senate, uh, the Senate did approve an amendment from Senator Joe Benning, uh, the Republican majority leader and a member of the uh, minority leader, sorry. He'll, he'll appreciate I'm sure he will. being called yeah. the majority leader, uh, and a member of the Judiciary Committee that mm -hmm. creates an affirmative defense mm -hmm. for people charged with threatening mm -hmm. um, that if they, if, it, if they don't have the means to carry out the threat, then, uh, you know, then they can argue that they shouldn't be charged. Mm -hmm. uh, or convicted of that crime. So mm -hmm. uh, that bill has now cleared the Senate. It's going on to the House, and uh, we'll see what what happens from there. But that was one of the priorities of the Senate Judiciary Committee heading mm -hmm. into the year. Uh, you covered a couple other bills this uh, this week. What else is going on? Absolutely. So uh, today, uh, the House gave its final approval to a bill related to trying to cut down on uh, what some people call timber rustling, uh, which is the stealing of people's people's trees, um, illegally harvesting or, and logging. Right. And this is something that's been an issue down in our common county, where we both both grew up in Bennington County. Right. There have been recently a series of arrests of uh, loggers who have gone out and uh, taken trees that they had no business taking. And so right now. Now the state has pretty stiff, like in civil court, you can be sued for triple the value of, oh, the, wow. of, of, of the damages. And so the civil law has kind of caught up with it. And so what the, what the House approved today was a pilot program that would make it possible, and it's still voluntary, for landowners to disclose to the state that, hey, I have a logging operation going on. This is who's doing it. This is where it is. This is when it's going to happen. This is uh, how big the area is. And mm -hmm. so this way, the state is aware of what's going on. And uh, what this does is follows actually another bill that's been uh, kind of content, kind of de uh, debated a fair amount uh, this se session and that it would make it mandatory. And mm -hmm. so my, my view of things right now is that this voluntary bill is going to be the eventual compromise and that the mandatory right. bill it maybe is just going to go away. Now, uh, are people going and logging on other people's land uh, just because they don't know that it's not allowed or 
you know, are these are these like business minded people who think, hey, I can go grab some free wood and resell it. You know, that's up to a jury to decide. I think. <laughs> I just wonder I if, mean, they, if they I mean, know I can, what's I driving mean, this yeah. Problem. I mean, one of the questions, you know, so one it was actually on my old uh, road, uh, School Farm Road, growing, growing up in Arlington. Uh, there was a logging operation. The guy was supposed to take, I don't know, ten acres or something uh -huh. like that on one guy's property. It right. was a property that abutted up next to it, and he just went over and allegedly grabbed a bunch from over there as well. Ah, okay. um, so you know, whether he was legitimately confused right. about where the, where the boundary line is, or whether he decided to help himself to it, yeah. is going to be something that's going to be sorted out either by jury yeah. or by, by a plea agreement, I, I expect. Okay. Um, but you know, this I think is mm. intended to what one cut down on, on confusion, you right. know, and uh, but two also hopefully cut down on people who had the intent. Yeah. Uh, because it's business, you right. know, it's money. Right. Yeah. right. Easy money for some people. For some, for for sure. All right. Uh, one of the bills that did make the uh, crossover deadline was H one seventy one. It uh, it deals with regulating e cigarettes. Yeah. What's going on? The with that? Uh, the House Human Services Committee on Thursday, yesterday. Uh, they passed it out on a 10 to 1 vote and what it does is it looks to regulate e-cigarettes uh, or vape vaping as they call it mm -hmm. with uh, along the same lines as traditional cigarettes mm -hmm. and it will require merchants to who sell e-cigarettes and e-cigarette components to keep them either behind the counter out of reach of customers or in a locked case if they're not behind and out of reach of customers uh, this is something that has been opposed by uh, retailers, it's been opposed by tobacco companies, and for retailers they say it's just a burden on, on uh, stores because they don't necessarily have a lot of space behind the counter. If you look behind any sort of convenience store, it's pretty jam-packed with sure. other tobacco products and, mm -hmm. and various other things they sell. So they're concerned about uh, having an undue burden of finding a place to put these things. Mm -hmm. And tobacco companies are arguing that uh, there's just no scientific or not enough scientific evidence to uh, to show that these are actually harmful to you. Right. And remember, that's an argument that they presented all the way through the 90s yes. as well about, <laughs> uh, regular, uh, about regular cigarettes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and, and I think there is, uh, if you talk to committee chairwoman uh, representative Ann Pugh, mm -hmm. she'll tell you there is some competing science out there. Uh, but she believes that it should be treated in the same way as traditional cigarettes and uh, should be out of reach of customers. And another point she made was a lot of these e-cigarettes cost twenty, thirty dollars for the, the hardware. Mm -hmm. And she said merchants should probably want to keep them off the counter anyway mm -hmm. so people aren't uh, stealing them. So that's an interesting, interesting. point of view. 10-1 to uh, vote, Representative uh, Paul Dame of Essex, mm -hmm. uh, Republican. He was the only one to vote against it and he has cited uh, a similar argument to the tobacco companies saying there's just not enough evidence to show that uh, that it's harmful uh, to your health, like cigarettes. Mm -hmm. um, and is, it, is, is, is there another component of the bill that has to do with use? Yes, there is an. Uh, it would basically restrict the use of e-cigarettes anywhere that traditional cigarettes are banned. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a hospital, if you go to a school, uh, anywhere where traditional cigarettes are not allowed, mm -hmm. e-cigarettes can also not be used. So inside any any bar, pretty much. Right, right? which yeah. is a big thing because. Uh, if you go to any bar lately, you'll probably see someone uh, mm -hmm. puffing on one of these uh, e-cigarettes and uh, it, it, it sort of uh, expels vapor, which is not smoke, and that's the, mm -hmm. the argument uh, people are making that there's no secondhand smoke involved, people should be able to do this where they want. Um, the committee thought otherwise. That's now headed to the floor, should uh, be up for a vote next week, and, uh, and we'll see where that goes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, you, so on, on the campaign front, uh, an interesting press conference this week. Uh, yes. Strange uh, bedfellows, perhaps, to yeah. see uh, talking together. Uh, Matt Dunn and uh, former Lieutenant Governor candidate uh, Dean Corn were talking this week about campaign financing. What, uh, what was Peter, going on? Peter Galbraith. Peter, Peter Galbraith, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so Matt Dunn was uh, announced a press conference earlier this week to talk about uh, wanting to ban corporate contributions to candidates. And the very next day, there was another press release issued saying that former Wyndham County Senator Peter Galbraith would be joining him. That's been one of uh, Peter Galbraith's big issues. Uh, what makes it so interesting is that he, Peter Galbraith is very much uh, considering his own run for governor and publicly considering his own run for governor. Um, so these two folks uh, who are yesterday were together uh, talking about the need to ban corporate contributions very well may be primary opponents in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll have to wait and see how that goes. But in the meantime, Matt Dunn, one of the two Democratic gubernatorial candidates, <clears throat> he is calling on his uh, 
fellow camp candidates to send back any contributions from corporations and reject any future ones. He himself has sent back about $16,000 in contributions uh, from businesses. Um, of the three other candidates in the race, Democrats Sue Minter, Republican Lieutenant Governor Phil Scott, and uh, former Wall Street executive Bruce Lissman, none of the three basically are uh, jumping on that pledge with uh, Matt Dunn, and they say uh, they'll continue to review each contribution from corporations. And uh, Sue said uh, Sue Minter said she will reject anything from uh, Wall Street, but uh, she's happy to take contributions from. Uh, Vermont small businesses who appreciate her agenda for the state and uh, the others feel largely the same way so mm -hmm. uh, we'll wait and see for now Matt Dunn is out sixteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars and nobody else is jumping on board with this pledge and uh, Peter Galbraith may or may not soon be uh, in the race he, he told us to watch this space as in the very room we're in right now the Cedar Creek room because he might be back in a week or two to announce something so I see. we shall wait and see mm -hmm. Joining us now is Karen Richards, Executive Director with the Vermont Human Rights Commission, and we are going to talk about a pending bill regarding uh, fair and impartial policing. This is an issue that came up this week, a discussion in the House Judiciary uh, Committee, and they're going to be uh, talking about it and possibly voting on it today. So Karen, tell me, what is the point of this bill? What are, what, what are you trying to achieve with this? So um, there was a bill passed last year that ended up, um, I think it's Act 193, that um, required all agencies to adopt a model um, fair and impartial policing policy and also required them to collect certain data during traffic stops. And that data is, has to do with age, gender, race, um, what happened with the stop, whether a ticket was issued, not issued. Uh, so it's a laundry list, basically, of things that are supposed to be collected. And then there was language in the bill that said that um, the police agencies should endeavor both to collect this information, they're required to collect it, but also to figure out some way to um, report it out and analyze it. And so because the legislation only kind of asked them nicely to do this, um, what's happening is the agencies, as far as we know, are collecting the data, but there's no place where it's actually being sent and collected mm -hmm. and so that the public can analyze um, sure. the results of it. So so, so right now, if I, if I want to know what's going on with, with, say, Montpelier City Police, there's no clearinghouse. I have to do a records request with Montpelier City Police, right? Right. So you would have to do if um, a Freedom of Information Act request for every single police agency in the state or for the ones that you you were interested in doing. So what this bill would do would be to create essentially a central place where all police agencies on an annual basis would have to upload their information into the database and then it would be available in a format, an electronic format, and on a website where any member of the public could go on and say, okay, well, I want to know what's going on in Montpelier, or I want to look at Washington County as a whole, or I want to see what's happening with my police departments on these issues. So um, that's the main goal of it. And then the other piece of it is to ensure that every police officer in the state receives um, training on fair and impartial policing. Mm -hmm. So the way it is right now, the um, academy teaches it to new recruits mm -hmm. and they go through a four hour um, course that I've sat in on and um, think is very good. Mm -hmm. um, but then once, once they're through that recruit process, there's nothing requiring um, officers who have been on the job mm -hmm. to have that training. So this would require all officers to have that training. Mm -hmm. And right now we're looking at by um, 2018. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, resistance did you get to the act requiring these policies? And, and what kind of ongoing resistance do you, do you feel right now? Um, really, law enforcement, um, at least at the, you know, the leadership level, mm -hmm. is really on board with this. I think, you know, looking around um, at the things that have happened around the nation, people are, police officers are concerned about their image in the community mm -hmm. and um, their ability to protect and serve if they um, don't have the right. trust and respect of the community. So I think law enforcement, they're not really pushing back on the concepts. Mm -hmm. It's more, you know, the resources that it takes to um, actually make sure that the data right. is in a collectible form and, right. and whether they have the um, technology and experience, technological experience to be able to upload it and do what they need to do. So, and Most of us wouldn't, wouldn't think that we're biased, but we have 
these inherent biases and in, in things uh, that we subconsciously believe or feel or think. Um, so was, were you finding that most law enforcement officers or most people in general were, uh, were not believing that we had a, an issue here in Vermont? Um, I think that um, that's kind of, it's not just law enforcement, that's kind of the reaction that I get generally uh -huh. from people in Vermont is that this isn't an issue here. Um, right. You know, we're all good people and mm -hmm. we all take people at face value and this, this isn't an issue in Vermont. And what the um, implicit bias training does, both for police officers and I've been doing it um, for the general public now, is it, it shows you that the way that your brain operates and the way that we are programmed as humans, mm -hmm. we automatically have bias. And not all bias is bad, um, but when it affects your perceptions and then um, goes in over into your behavior, that's right. when it starts to become problematic. And so um, I think for most people when they do the implicit bias training, whether it's through the academy or just the, the um, training that I'm doing, most people have this kind of aha moment about, oh, this isn't me, this is my brain. Mm -hmm. And I just need to learn what my brain is doing, why my brain is doing it, and then and, and then I can start to use these strategies that you're teaching me to try to overcome sure. it. One of the topics of discussion on Wednesday was this idea of making a model policy. And uh, so there was some discussion, should there be a single model policy or should each and every department adopt its, its own policy right. to reflect the, dem the demographics of, of its community? Where do, you, where do you fall on that? Do you think there should be one model policy for all departments? Or do you think uh, Winooski and Colchester should have a different model policy than say Montpelier or Bennington? Um, I think everyone should have a single model policy. That's um, something that I've also been working on. And I think the reason that that's important is that you don't want people to have a different experience going from one area of the state to the to another, right? So you want to have a common set of standards that everyone's applying and using, and that way I, I know whether I'm here in Washington County or I'm in Orange County or I'm down in Bennington that I'm going to be treated the same way by police officers according to this, um, at least the essential elements of the policy. So, and I don't, I mean, no matter where you are, you're going to encounter difference. And so, and really in areas that, um, where you're not encountering difference as often are the areas where you're more likely to have a problem, right? Because you're not so used to it. Um, and that's when those unconscious biases a lot of times can really um, show their ugly heads. <laughs> sure, sure, ab 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 absolutely. Um, so where do you think this is, this is gonna go? Is, um, so I mean, we're now, this is, this is Friday, it's March 11th, this is yep. what they call crossover day at the legislature, which yep. is in theory all non-money bills are supposed to be out of, out of their committees yep. by uh, today. Where do, where, where do you think this is going right now? Well, I'm hoping that House Judiciary is going to be able to take a vote on it this afternoon. Um, we have pretty much, um, after the testimony the other day, uh, we did another draft of the bill that we think um, satisfies most of the concerns that law enforcement expressed. Um, and most of the parties are, or all the parties are pretty much on board, I think. So um, we're hoping that the committee will vote it out. There's some things that may need to be tweaked in it, but we're hoping that we can work on those um, smaller pieces in the Senate. Very good, excellent. Well, Karen, thank you so much for, for being with us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, I guess that's pretty much a wrap for uh, this crossover week. Uh, we will be back next week with another edition of Capital Beat from Orca Media and the Vermont Press Bureau. Until then, you can find this show on orcamedia.net or vermontpressbureau.com. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you.